What y'all listening to? Lime My Highlight Podcast. All right, welcome back to the Limelight Highlight Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Rosario, and on this episode of the podcast, we're actually doing something a little different. Instead of the weekly good stories, we're actually interviewing um, Pat Costello, Ken Costello, and Tim Costello? Yes. Yes, three Costellos. Um, if you guys want to introduce yourselves, you can do so now. Uh, Pat Costello, son of Jack Costello of the Jack Costello Boxing Club. I'm Ken Costello, second son of Jack Costello, one of 10 kids, uh, advisor to the club, for mm-hmm. lack of a better word. I'm Tim Costello, uh, Jack's grandson. Uh, my dad and my uncle opened up this gym in 96. Okay. And um, the reason you guys are here is um, I got in touch with you from your son, Brian. Mm-hmm. Um, he gave me your number, but I got in touch with Brian from Tommy, who's the president of the block is back. And as I said before, this podcast is full of a, a positive podcast right? and um, all the work that, you know, your dad has done in the community and now you and then uh, your son is running the gym. So kind of just wanted to get a little um, background on, you know, you can go on Wikipedia and find out and even on the boxing page. But to you guys, who was Jack Costello? Besides being my dad, mm. he was um, he he was a great guy. But um, I, like you, you, we spoke earlier. You read in the uh, one line about him being in a career. He went. He was a boxer. He was an amateur boxer out of Kensington section of Philadelphia. I grew up in Port Richmond, and um, he was getting ready to turn pro, and then ended up into Korea. When he came out of Korea, married my mom, had ten kids. But he always had the love for boxing, so he spent the rest of his life pretty much training amateur kids with with the object of teaching them uh, discipline, self worth, keeping off the street, getting a good job, and that kind of thing. But he, he had a regular job too. He worked for Pico for the last twenty years, and the electric worked, company, right? Electric company, yeah. yeah. But he, before that, he worked for Midvale Steel. They went out on strike. They never came back. I think he worked for Herman Goldner's for a little while, which is an industrial company. They do home repairs and things like that, refrigeration, all kinds of stuff. Then he got the job in Pico, and I guess he had 20, 20 almost 25 years or something like that. Don't hold me to that. But we're prejudiced because he was our father, but anybody that knew him will tell you he was larger than life. And he wasn't, he wasn't a blowhard. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't a guy that came in and tried to take over the room. But when he spoke, everybody listened. And he, and he only... He just said things that meant something, you know, you, you just, everything he said was important. And uh, that's what we were raised on. And uh, it's a real tribute to Patrick and Timmy and Brian and my sister, Carol, and all the people that have kept that club going, but it's named in his honor. And I'm sure he'd be very proud of them for what they've done. I never got to meet my grandfather. He died the year before I was born. But uh, I can't tell you how many times my whole life, even my friends, anytime they wear a gym shirt, they get stopped constantly. Yeah. You know Jack Costello? You know Jack? Jack was the greatest. And it's people of all ages. I mean, people that went to high school with him, people that you know worked with him back in the day, knew him from boxing, to kids my own age that just know of the gym and just know of the Costello name because of my grandfather. He really was just genuinely the best guy. He helped everybody, and that's what everybody said. He's the guy you can count on. He's the guy you could call, and he'd always be there for you. And opening the gym, something me and my cousin talked about recently, a good way to say about the gym because people always ask if we were fighters. I never boxed in my life. I trained here and there, but we mostly help people through boxing. And that's what I've learned from my grandfather. He loved boxing, and he loved helping people. We opened the gym to help people as a way to do it through boxing, getting people into the gym, helping you know young kids out. But just hearing from what he did to kids and like the community back in the day, just helping everybody out, it's just something you look up to. And seeing my uncles, my dad, I mean... It's just, you know, it's an honor to be a part of it. And when they say this gym is a nonprofit organization, they're not kidding. Correct me if I get the facts wrong, guys, but they charge $10 a month gym dues. You you get in whether you have the money or not. They, they don't, I don't think they turn anybody away. Uh, they, some, they keep it going with, I'll say, donations, 
The, uh, the one beef and beer that we run every year is a big sellout. If you heard us talking about it earlier, every year, Timmy, who's not here tonight, is a nervous wreck that it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Timmy is father, not the other guy. Yeah. Uh, and every year he gets the same 400 people to show up, and they can't wait to do it. It's wow. just, you know, it's something they look forward to. And it's a, it's a fun thing. It's not just a, a charity. We all have a good time at it. It's family and friends. It's the same 400 people every year. Yeah. It's a good time. My dad worked for Midvale Steel. It was Midvale Heppenstall, a steel company. Yeah, Roxborough, Manny Yonk. The building, they used to pour uh, cannons for the, or barrels for the tanks during the war. And um, it's actually, the building is in a a Guinness Book of World Records for the tallest one-story building in the world because when they started pouring the, the, the barrel, the tank barrels, they couldn't, they couldn't stop. Long story short, they were, um, they went out on strike and, um, I actually walked my first picket line, Union picket line. I think it was eight years old. It really? Yeah. And <laughs> it was for, it was for Midvale Steel, and it ended up they ended up going out of business after that strike. We just moved in the house where we're sitting now in, in 1965 or 66, I think it was. So we had a new house, ten kids, no job, <laughs> and there was no unemployment. There was no unemployment. There was no uh, strike fund. There was no nothing. So he was going out looking for, looking for work. That's how he ended up working at working at Goldner's. But he never gave up. And the one passion that he that he never wavered from was the boxing. And the, and the reason because it, the 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 boxing wasn't was to help the kids. To help the kids on the street, he grew up on the street, and uh, well, he hit my, my grandparents and all that. But it was all hard work back then. My my grandparents were uh, they were through the depression and everything else. So when we moved in here, there was a couple there was a couple bad gangs that hung in the neighborhood. One right here on the corner, um, another one up up a couple blocks, and I remember. Um, we have a sister, Miriam. She's second. She's deaf, can't talk, never heard a sound. And she goes up to the... My mom would send her up to the grocery store after finally got her out of the house because the kids would tease her. But said they could buy them a call. Send her with a note, but called the guy up, told her he was coming. So, um... Naturally, the kids teased her, turned into a, turned into a big ordeal. So my dad went up and gave the guys on the corner a visit, <laughs> and the um, he grabbed the biggest guy on the corner. He was probably in his forties or fifties or whatever, but they were eighteen, nineteen years old. I never forget the kid Billy Hayes. He grabbed the biggest guy on the corner and said, "You know, he he grabbed the biggest guy because he knew he was going to take care of him and let the." <laughs> So as a result of that, the um, ain't a bother anymore. They would carry her groceries from the store after that <laughs> nice. down to the house, and but the, there was respect there, wasn't yeah. it? He he was a, he was six foot one or six two something like that, and he was a tough guy, but he was a gentleman, and it was respect. So the, the the gang down here on this corner, it was Whitey and Joe Peak and all them guys. The nine gang, yeah, battle. My uh, dad's at the gym at the time at Harrogate Boxing Club, training the kids. All the kids used to come here and meet, and he would take them down to the gym. He did a 1965 Ford station wagon, which he had for about 15 years. So my mom's sitting on the porch with my grandmother, who at the time was 80 or in her 80s, and a nice night like tonight, sitting down on the porch, and they come home. My dad leaves to the gym with the kids, and when he comes home, now they're in the house, and it's hot, and they're saying, "Why are you sitting in the house?" And well, because the guys on the corner, f this, mf that, f this, and uh, so my dad goes up the corner. He says, "Hey, Billy, hey Joey, come here. I want to talk to you." And when they walked out, he grabbed them both by the hair of the head and banged their heads together. Yeah, right. And that once again, the, no more problems after that. But what became of those two incidents was. Uh, my dad told this kid, Billy, he said, Billy, if you don't turn your life around, you're going to end up doing life on the installment plan. Hmm. And it wasn't a matter of 
I'm the tough guy, leave my family alone, or you're messing with the wrong guy, or you're messing with the wrong family. It was a matter of he wanted to get through these kids. So we end up getting a, actually a lot of them from this corner and the other corner. Went down to Jim Mark Conran. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Billy Canadis kids name was, and um, a, a couple of them. J- j- as the other guy that they, the two kids that had their heads banged together. Joey turned out really good. He actually got his life turned around. He's doing good. I see him today. Billy not so much. He did end up doing his life on the installment plan. But I remember my mom hollering because my dad took money, like he had money, and he took money out of the kitty and went and bought Billy a pair of sneakers. <laughs> yeah. Now he's got 10 kids, he's working three jobs, and he's Yeah, we didn't have stuff. any sneakers. No, that's not true. <laughs> and, uh, that's not true. It, but he gave this kid a pair of sneakers. And my mom was, was man, he was trying to get through to the kid. And um, that's just, the, that's, just the way he was. So when we got, it, I, I could tell you a million stories like that uh, through through our whole through our whole life growing up. And um, you want well, to- no, I just I just add you you can't help the family you're born into, right? You're born into a family, and whatever happens sure to your family, not. that's your family. It's sure just the way not. it goes. And I'm obviously I'm going to say it again, Jonathan. We're biased. I'm talking about my family, but. We have a colorful family. I, we, I always say we're, we were never the Brady Bunch, but even the Brady Bunch wasn't the Brady Bunch, right? Right. So, TV show, yeah. And the boxing was an important part of my dad's life, but it, he was he did help he helped people everywhere. There's a I don't know if there's a group called Malvern. It's a, it's a religious retreat that when we graduated eighth grade, it's a men's retreat. It's uh, it, when it started anyway. Um, when you graduated eighth grade. My dad grabbed us the third weekend of August. You were going away for the weekend with my dad and my uncles, and it's a religious retreat. When I was young, I liked it because I was hanging out with my brothers. Well, like, there's my older brother, Steve. He went one year, then the next year was me, then it was Timmy. It was every, everybody, every year somebody graduated eighth grade, we brought the, whole, the rest of that family out. Well, between the ages of 18 and 23, the last place I wanted to be on a weekend in August was at this retreat because all my buddies are playing football in the bars and a girl, blah, blah, you get the whole thing, you know, and... Uh, but it became a big part of our lives. And correct me if I'm saying any of this wrong, Pat, but AA was also a big part of his life, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm proud of that because of what it meant to our family. He got sober, and I think I got this right, when he met a guy at Malvern. He straight got him on Ed Friel. Yeah. yeah. And uh, got him in AA, completely changed his life around, hadn't drank for 28 years. Wow. Uh, but And I don't, again, I say that with pride, Jonathan, because... People that we grew up with were all AA people, and they were the best people in the world. They were they were regular people. People had rough lives and did things that we all did, you know. And uh, they were the, they became our parents' friends for life, and uh, they were just the best people in the world. But my dad was always helping people, and I'm glad we got time because I can tell you this story. Little de- God works in strange ways. In 1990, I hope I don't embarrass you, and if I'm wrong, feel free to tell me. Uh, they were supposed to go to Ireland. My dad and mom always wanted to go to Ireland. I think it was like 1987. What, whatever year the flight got shot down over Lockerbie, Scotland. You can look that up because I don't know the date. But when that happened, they canceled the trip to Ireland. Well, 1990, they finally decided to go. They're going to go. So they go to Ireland March or April or something like that. You know, I'm going to embarrass you, but Patrick got an AA in 1990. Am I right? Okay. Um, and then... My at the end of our at the end at the end of the night at our retreat exercises in Malvern, our group has an AA meeting, and my dad was a guy that would chair the meeting, which means he would open up the meeting and invite people to come up and speak. Well, that particular year, he spoke at the meeting, and I'm telling you, we used to go to his anniversary meeting every every anniversary of sobriety. We'd go to his meeting in the Northeast meeting up here, and they'd have cake and coffee, and we'd, we'd have stupid kids. We didn't even know what it was probably, but it was big to my family, to my parents. You must have set a hell of an example, too. Awesome, so. awesome. So that year at Malvern, 1990, even though we had heard his story 10 or 12 times, nobody was speaking when he was speaking. I, I remember thinking, my, my daughter had just been born a year earlier, and I was videotaping every little thing she did. And I thought, man, I wish I had a video camera to videotape my father speaking at that meeting, which you probably wouldn't be allowed to do because it's Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm. But um, defeat, defeat the purpose a yeah. little bit. <laughs> but little did we know, those things, ha- those three great things happened that year, and he died two oh, wow. two months later. Yeah, they said God works in strange ways. We didn't know that, but 
Uh, he was just, I'll say it again, he was just larger in life.